Good morning. What a nice, nice faces here in the congregation. I'm glad to see you. It's nice to be together this holiday weekend. I never know how many folks are going to come out on a holiday weekend, and I'm so pleased to see you. Lots of announcements in the bulletin, things to know. Um, I got informed yesterday, I got a call from our um, contemporary musician, Leslie Athanasian, that she wasn't feeling well. So she will not be leading our worship, our contemporary part, but I've got some volunteers. Uh, Debbie and Cindy are going to lead us in um, Go Tell It on the Mountain Should Be Easy. We know that song. And then we'll sing a special song that they'll announce. We're going to sing one of my favorites, the one that James Taylor made famous, In the Bleak Midwinter. And we'll sing that. It's a hymn, but they'll announce that when the time comes. Um, we need some greeters. Many of you have been helpful. To, you, you were greeted as you came into church today. And we have volunteers that do that. The membership committee needs greeters in January and February. So when you go out and are greeted, if you'd like to speak to one of our greeters or even one of our ushers and say, hey, I can say good morning and shake hands with people and make them feel welcome. So I, that would be wonderful if you could do that today. You see the rest of our announcements. The church office is closed tomorrow, and then we dive back in on Tuesday with a wonderful, busy January. We've got great things coming up in January, and watch this space as we make plans for that. Um, there's a few folks on our prayer list, but I'll talk about that at prayer time. Welcome. Let's worship God together. For four Sundays, folks gathered around this Advent wreath and lit candles. Almost the reverse of birthdays, adding up one, two, three, four. But today we only light one the Christ candle, the white candle in the middle that reminds us of Jesus and his birth last week. It's an odd Christmas and Advent season. Last Sunday was the fourth Sunday in Advent. And there's not another Sunday of Christmas in these 12 days between Christmas Day and Epiphany. 
I'm still preaching on wise men next week. <laughs> the candles in our church are symbolic. Do you recall that the candles on the communion table over the Bible remind us of the presence of the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit came to the church in the book of Acts like fire. So we light these candles. The rest of the candles are Christmas, uh, Christmas lights. But the Christ candle reminds us of our Lord Jesus. Born and raised and died and is in heaven. Jesus. The light of the world. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we move from Christmas to New Year's to a new year, help us keep our eyes on Jesus and the Christ candle signifying his birth, his life among us. We're profoundly grateful for all that Jesus does for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Please join me for the call to worship song in your bulletin. As the land is renewed each year and new crops sprout, so the Lord God is restoring us. We are transformed by God's glory and power. God's revelation in the little child. Salvation shall bring complete transformation. The Lord God is saving us. With our whole being, we rejoice in our God. Let us worship God. Please stand and join in singing the opening hymn number 115, Away in Maine.
in the name of Jesus Christ, whose birth we still celebrate, we are forgiven. You may share the peace of Christ with those around you. Peace be with you. page 70 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles. This is the song of Zechariah about God's help in the past, present, and the future. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies, and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to, the, to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Are there children who'd like to come down for a time with me? Good. See if this is on. Now, hi, Gracie, would you like to come talk to me for a minute? We'll have a little bit of a children's time. Let's come down, sit down, we'll wait on somebody else. I like your blue jean jacket. I've got one of those. Nice to see you again. Did either of you get any presents this week? I did! <laughs> did you get presents from mom and dad? Grandparents? Did you get presents? What'd you get? A switch. A Nintendo switch. <laughs>
Christmas Eve at your grandparents. What could be better? So, it's important we do fun things, but we've got to remember first that Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And all the things that we do, the presents we get, and the fun activities we do, the most important thing is to remember whose birthday it is. Whose birthday is Christmas? Jesus' birthday. So let's always remember that. We go into a new year. I can't believe it's going to be 2024. A whole new year. But let's keep Jesus first. Let's pray. I'll say a line and you all say a line. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Help us to remember. Help us to remember. It's his birthday. It's his birthday. And we're grateful. And we're grateful. You sent him to us. You sent him to us. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand if you're able and sing with us hymn number 136. Don't tell them on that. Just lots of folks to pray for. You know, we think of Christmas as a wonderful season, but it can also be a sad season. We are aware of friends, family members who aren't with us anymore as we gather around the tree, as we open presents, as we're with families. We recognize our own heartaches. So be tender to each other and pray for each other in this season. There's um, a lot of joy in the laughter of a child who did get presents for Christmas. And I think that's a, a nice balance. Um, several folks uh, in, the, in the church have been in the hospital and are out. We've got some folks who are, are out and with us today, and that's just great. And John Reese is back home. He was in the hospital last Sunday, and I'm pleased that he's doing well. Um, Bob and Renee Turner, uh, Timmer are trying to decide what's best for them. I don't know if Bob's here today, but um, probably taking Renee back to their home up north, uh, Michigan, I believe. Um, but she's much better, but still kind of struggling, and she's in the 
uh, Ocala Rehab down on, on 50, um, not 50, 40, all these numbers. Um, Ann Vandenberg, I haven't confirmed this, but she was to leave life care and go home, and she was thrilled to be going home. Some of these folks are watching us on video, so we'll um, acknowledge them and let them know that we're praying for them. Let's, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, you wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. Your mercy, let us share the divine life of Jesus Christ who came to share our humanity, now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. We're so grateful for that. God of mystery and might, we praise and worship you. For you came in silence when all lay sleeping to enter our world as a child of humble birth. Lord God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, born of his hand, your handmaiden, Mary. In his face, we behold your glory. In his life and death and your gift of salvation, we have life. We're grateful for the stories in the Bible and the miracles that Jesus did and the miracles that Jesus continues to do for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When doctors are amazed at someone's recovery, we know, O oh Lord, that you are hard at work, bringing healing and wholeness and wellness. Even when things don't go exactly as we are planned, when something happens and makes us sad, we know that you're with us. We remember the story that Jesus wept at the tomb of his good friend Lazarus. Lord, we know you experience all the emotions. You weep with us. You laugh with us. You have joy with us. We pray for folks who need your healing, your care, your love. We pray for folks who grieve this Christmas season. We pray for all who are on duty in our armed services, in law enforcement, working in a variety of places, sometimes forgotten. Lord, there are folks working in factories this holiday season to catch up. There are folks on oil rigs out in the Gulf and other places. There are folks who operate the TV cameras that make the bowl games come into our TVs and all who are playing the sports. We're grateful for everybody who makes our life easier this New Year's Eve. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, be with each of us. Teach us, lead us, guide us. We pray for your church. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I've got one more prayer announcement that I remembered in the midst of my prayer. Um, Sharon Shirley in our church who sings in the choir, her son-in-law died suddenly yesterday. And um, Sharon has gone to be with them. Uh, her daughter, we'll put that in the prayer list for next week, but... Sharon's uh, and her daughter both were very shook by that, by his unexpected passing yesterday. So we'll please keep Sharon in our prayers and her family as well. And um, lots, lots going on.
Christmas, we appreciate you. You bring beauty to our worship service every week. We're grateful. I want to preach a little bit about Jesus' family tree and our family trees this season. This is um, right after Jesus' baptism. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about the baptism and then the family tree that Luke records. This is on page 73 in the New Testament. I'll, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but listen to the word of God. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. He was the son, as was thought, of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Mephet, son of Levi, son of Malachi, son of Jenny, son of Joseph, son of Matthias, son of Amos, son of Nahum, son of Elsie, son of Nagai. I'm going to skip some of these names. <laughs> Picking up at verse 31, son of Meli, son of Menah, son of Matthiah, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed, son of Boaz, son of Salah, son of Nahum, son of Abinadab, son of Admin, son of Ari, son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham. Luke continues all the way back to Adam, but I think that gives us a picture of Jesus' family tree. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his holy word.
Thank you so much, Cindy, Debbie, Cosimo. I appreciate you practicing that at the last minute and bringing that to us. I do love that song uh, because James Taylor played it on, it was on the radio 15 years ago and has always touched me. So we're thinking about the generations and the family trees. Now, y'all know I'm a Southerner. I love to go to the graveyards of my ancestors. I like to go to their old homes or the grounds their homes used to be on. You don't have to read much Harper Lee or Truman Capote or, or even John Grisham to know that's how we Southerners are. Thomas Oliver Bridgeforth was my grandmother's grandfather. He came to this country in about 1830. First he lived near Athens, Alabama, then DeSoto County, Mississippi. I guess he came too early. He settled in the hills south of Memphis, not far from Faulkner's Frenchman Bend in Yaknakpataka County. He came too early to claim the land in the rich delta soil along the Mississippi River that grows that white gold called cotton. I don't know much about Thomas Oliver Bridgeforth's family, why they left Scotland when they did. I imagine the Bridgeforths were from the village of Stirling, the last bridge over the Forth of the Firth of Forth, the River Forth there, not far from Edinburgh, but I don't know that for sure. I don't know why they left. Millions of Scots left in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, even into the 20th century. They came here, founded this church. That part of Scotland, uh, Stirling and Edinburgh, was awfully close to England, and the English were tough on the Scots. Oh, they couldn't worship freely. They had to come to America to do that. I wish I knew more about the people in my family tree, the Grays and the Bridge Force and the Joneses, the raspberries. Yes, I have raspberries in my family tree. <laughs> and Winkelmans from Switzerland. Jesus knew who his people were. Mary and Joseph taught him who he was as a young Jewish boy. Even to this day, ask a Jewish friend. They know what tribe they're from. They know who their ancestors are. That's very important in their tradition and even in the oral culture of Jesus' day. When Jesus was about 30 years old, he began his ministry. Son, as it was supposed, of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Matthi, son of Levi, and so on. I loved the reading of Jesus' family tree. God moves in mysterious ways through history. Unseen time and people. Looking back at that story, some of those folks in Jesus' line aren't so good. Even bad guys in our stories. Nancy's father began to do work on the family tree about 30 years ago, when the internet was young. About the time I got grafted onto that Neiman family tree. Sometimes we do that. We get adopted into or grafted onto or married into, and the family tree gets bigger and branchier. Anyway, Ted researched his whole family and found a great uncle he didn't know about. A man who had lived in Missouri and left Missouri and seemed to disappear, more digging on the internet. He found cousins in San Antonio and went to visit. And he found out that their grandfather had gone to jail in Missouri for stealing horses <laughs> and had to flee to Texas when his term was up. The family cut him off. There are mysteries, heroes, even stinkers in our family trees, too. Luke has a wonderful recording uh, in this. I didn't read it all, but there are 11 sets of seven names. 
77 total names from Jesus all the way back to Adam and Eve. Heroes and stinkers. We see clearly as Luke, Luke sets Jesus firmly within human history and within the Jewish people. And we have to remember that Jesus was Jewish and lived a Jewish life his whole life at a particular time and place in history. Luke makes the point over and over again. He tells John the Baptist story. He tells this story of Jesus' family. We have a story here as well. With 11 members, Ocala's first Presbyterian church was chartered as a home mission in 1856 by the Presbytery of Florida. For the first 27 years, we didn't have an installed pastor, but stated supply ministers came to the church uh, until we received our first minister in 1884. In 1887, we were a 40 member church and built a sanctuary not far from here. I've read that it could seat 300 people. They were optimists. <laughs> On June 28, 1928, we dedicated this building and had a sacred recital on a three-manual pilcher organ that was donated by the women of the church. You gave the organ. The bell that same bell we ring to ring in worship with tin gongs every Sunday morning was over in the original church. It's big. I've seen it in the tower. And it was brought here on a wagon and hoisted into our steeple so long ago. In 1936, the men of the church decided to bring a scout troop here, Troop 72, it's still here and run by men of our church. Oh, what the history is rich. I read about Pastor Dr. Dodge, but mostly about his wife, Mrs. Dodge, who was called an angel to the community. I've read all this in Tom Weaver's history of our church called Faithfulness Sustains the Generations. It's in our church library. I want to read Don McCormick's book, Planters, Plantations, and Presbyterians, about the folks of Florida. His great-grandfather was the Reverend W.J. McCormick, one of the first visiting pastors who came down here from Kanapaha in Gainesville uh, and kept us going. All those years, we didn't have an installed pastor. How much of this history did, did you know? I learned a lot this week reading those history books. It means a lot. How well do you know your Presbyterian history? None of us were there when John Knox preached in Edinburgh or John Calvin preached in Geneva. None of us were in the upper room when Jesus broke the bread and taught the disciples or when he was on the Sea of Galilee feeding the multitudes. But we have the stories in the Bible, in our history books, and they're our stories, our families. Oh, you heard me read some of those names in Luke. Nathan, and David, Jesse, and Obed, and Boaz. You remember Boaz, don't you? You remember who his wife was? Ruth, I preached on her not long ago. He married a foreigner who was loyal to his mother-in-law and adopted onto the family tree, became one of the ancestors of Jesus. Earlier I mentioned Thomas Oliver Bridgeforth who grew cotton in Alabama and Mississippi, just not in that rich Delta soil. I mentioned Nancy's family and a horse thief they tried to forget. What's your family's story? What does it mean? This uh, church's story is so filled with such interesting people. McKay's and 
Drakes and Albrights and lots of names that go way back. One of Jesus' ancestors was David. A man as big as Israel itself. A psalm writer, a shepherd boy, a giant killer, loyal soldier, renegade, a faithful friend. David was so much. The Bible tells us But he was also a stinker. Remember, he raped a woman and she turned up pregnant. The word of God came through the prophet Nathan. But David's son, with Bathsheba, was an ancestor of Jesus. Oh, we have such interesting stories. The story of First Presbyterian is our story. You're grafted onto this story now. So am I. We need to know our stories, who we are and whose we are. We need to know about our great-grandparents. We need to know the story of this church and especially the Bible stories. Todd read the speech by Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. Jesus' uncle, older cousin. I wish I knew the exact relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist. Mary and Elizabeth. But did you hear old Zechariah speak of promises from God? Promises to David, a covenant with Abraham. Language foreshadowing light and darkness, life and death. Those are all allusions to the story of Israel. The prophet, the Psalms. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. What rich words. I'm almost done. Let me give you some concluding thoughts. We need to know our family stories. We need to know the Bible and who we are and whose we are. We need to think seriously about our relationships with the Jews around us. Jesus was one of them. And they know the story of the Old Testament, and it's rich and it's meaningful. There's no place for anti-Semitism in Christianity. I hate to see that. No place for Jewish jokes or conspiracy theories. The Jews are our cousins. We're grafted onto their family tree. In a more and more secular America, we religious folks need to stick together, look out, for one another. I'm worried about the goings on in the Middle East. As y'all know, I don't preach politics from the pulpit, but I'm worried and I pray for them, for all the people of the Holy Land. Last point, God keeps his promises. For centuries, God promised to send a savior to the house of David. People looked and longed and waited, and when the time was right, when there was peace in the Middle East, when the Holy Roman Empire had their, maybe it wasn't the Holy Roman Empire yet, it was just the Roman Empire, they had control, God sent his son. So look at your family tree. Look back at maybe some missing branches. Ask somebody story. And let's remember Jesus' family tree and our story here at First Presbyterian. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith, which is found in your bulletin. Jesus was what we are. He grew up in a family and a society troubled by the common problems of the world. His knowledge was limited by his time and place in history. He felt deeply into joy of friendship and the hurt of being rejected. Jesus prayed, struggled with temptation, knew anger, and was subject to suffering and death. He was like Christ in every way except sin. Jesus was what he should be. He served his Father with complete trust and unwavering obedience. He loved all kinds of people and 
accepted their law. In constant dependence upon the Holy Spirit, Jesus allowed no temptation or threat to keep him from loving God with his whole being and his neighbor as himself. Please stand as we sing the closing hymn, number 116, The Snow Lay on the Ground. Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.